Welcome to the campus of North Idaho College and today's broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. Over the past few months, we have been bringing you a number of programs entitled Our Responsibility for Nature. Uh, these particular programs have been sponsored by the Association for the Humanities in Idaho to a group of faculty members at the University of Idaho. Today it is our pleasure to uh, bring the sixth and the final in that series entitled A Moral View of Recreation. To interview uh, our guest is a panel that uh, will ask questions to uh, the individual who is very distinguished, uh, Marvin Hinberg. He is an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Idaho and has held that position since 1976. He holds a BA uh, from Washington and Lee University, a master's degree from Oxford University, and a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. He is a Woodrow Wilson Fellow, a Danforth Fellow, and a Rhodes Scholar. His main interests are in social philosophy and the philosophy of mind, and he is author of a number of papers uh, in ethics. Uh, Dr. Hinberg, welcome to our program. Thank you, Tony. Joining with me in question our guest uh, is regular panelist Janelle Burke and visiting panel member Robert Singletary and uh, also Muriel Kirkpatrick. Both of the latter uh, two, Singletary and Kirkpatrick, are members of the faculty at North Idaho College. We'll commence the questioning with Janelle Burke. Well, Dr. Hinberg, you entitled your speech A Moral View of Recreation. And in the speech, you say, why a moral view of recreation? And then you answer that. Can you share with our viewers what your answers are? Why should a philosopher uh, become interested in recreation? Or why should we be interested in the philosophical view? I think I should start answering that by pointing out that in my use in the title of the word moral there, I use the word in a much broader sense than many of the people in the audience are likely to think of the word uh, moral. It's not that I'm strictly concerned with questions of how should I um, comport myself uh, with my fellow human beings, which of course is a very important question in uh, ethics, but it's also a question of what should I seek. That is, broadly understood, moral philosophy must concern itself with this question and possibly with that question before the other question, simply because an understanding of what it is you're looking for is going to be a very important guide toward how and whatever means you're going to use in seeking it. So the part of the paper that personally I'm most interested in is indeed that, that uh, part of it, that is, what is it in recreation that we should look for? Where do you think we've gone wrong in the past, perhaps? I, I think the main thing, saying we as Americans now, <laughs> uh, is that we have misemphasized the goods of recreation. Um, a funny thing happens about goods. They're fine in their place, but when they get misplaced, <coughs> they can turn to an ill. Uh, for instance, the one prime good that people see in recreation, and I don't dispute that it's a good in its own uh, proper sphere, is the good of getting away from it all. Now, that gives us perspective on our life, our work life, uh, all kinds of things. But in addition, if that is overemphasized, and when it's overemphasized, it can turn to an ill. Uh, we can ask of recreation to do things recreation should never be asked to do. For instance, solve problems at work. It may give us perspective on those problems, but it's not going to solve those problems. And people who look at recreation as a solution to problems they may be having on their job, just getting away from it all, may recreate with a vengeance, <coughs> consume too much, um, destroy things, in fact. Think of the, num the, the vandals in our public uh, forests and things like that. How, 
and ask yourself how many of them are possibly trying to work out frustrations on the job. If they are, they're asking of recreation to do something it shouldn't be asked to do. All of us know people who um, outfit themselves completely for a recreational pursuit, and you speak to that in the, in the paper. Uh, this feeling of, and, and you also spoke just a minute ago about uh, consuming too much, this feeling of having to outfit ourselves completely for an experience. That's true, and I, I think one of the reasons people have that particular um, wish is that they uh, let the uh, ethics, if I may so describe it, of the rest of the society, the ethics of the workplace, which is often, status is often a, uh, a function of conspicuous consumption uh, in, in other parts of our lives, they let that spill over into recreation. It's very sad because that takes the fun, the real fun out of recreation. Robert Singletary. It seems to me that um, there seems to be two extremes of um, <coughs> recreation or play or leisure that most Americans uh, approach. One is the getaway, where it's almost an effortless kind of thing. They don't want to expend any kind of effort. And one is that the, the leisure becomes almost work. They work at it so hard. How do we achieve a balance between I mean, there's obviously, either one of those extremes are not good for us, at least that's what you seem to be implying. Mm -hmm. How do we achieve that balance? Well, I think we reflect upon the concept of recreation a bit. Um, the word recreation comes from the Latin, a Latin word meaning to refresh or to restore mentally. Uh, its adjectival definition is play. And I think if we reflect on that and think about an allied word, the word recreate, to create afresh or to create anew, we'll focus upon what I argue are two neglected dimensions of recreation. The acquisition of skills uh, and simplicity, that is, the possibly the peeling off of uh, one way of describing it might be to say the peeling off of the layers of our social self and immerse ourselves in the case of the kind of recreation I'm talking about mm -hmm. for the sake of the series, immerse ourselves in nature. Immersion in nature, it seems to me, is very fundamentally simple, pleasurable, non-complex, and, and that's its very joy. I, I don't disagree with that at all. Mm -hmm. and, but I'm wondering, though, if we adhere to this concept and, and the, the method of doing this, how is this going to run? You mentioned at the beginning of your that, uh, um, paper that uh, recreation was a serious business. I'd like to concentrate on the business end. Of what, what will this do to us economically? Because uh, as we really look at it, uh, we do spend a phenomenal amount of money on recreational devices, vehicles, boats, uh, uh, gasoline, fuel. Uh, it's, it's unlimited. And uh, what, what will happen to, to that aspect if we follow this philosophy of simplicity and skill? Well, I, I, I'm going to turn the question around on you and, and then answer your question after I've turned it around. I think we should, I'm not denying the legitimacy of your question, mind you, uh, but I think we should also ask what is the economics of recreation doing to us economically also? One of the things it's doing to us, of course, is uh, predisposing us toward highly consumptive forms of leisure, which our economy, I would judge, personal judgment, of course, uh, which I would judge our economy can no longer, certainly in the 80s, can afford to absorb. Okay? So I think we have to ask both questions. Now, admittedly, there's a lot of uh, fundamental and important industries in this country dependent upon recreation. I suspect that the ones that are going to survive, many of them aren't going to survive not because of anything I've said or anything I would argue, but just because of the cost, the cost of energy that go into it. Uh, I suspect that the ones that are going to survive are the ones that are going to concentrate upon services as opposed to uh, providing actual material goods for leisure. That is, uh, perhaps taking people in groups uh, on buses, for instance, less energy consumptive, and introducing them in a uh, 
systematic and informed way to the varieties of wildlife in a region or something like that. If, they're, if they start saying, look, there's a quality dimension to your recreation in the out of doors, I think uh, that's still an economic activity. Services are, are as much an economic activity as the provision of goods. As a matter of fact, we've got a, an economy that is more service economy now than it is goods economy. So I think we're just going to have to turn to a service economy more in recreation as well. Muriel Kirkpatrick. You mentioned in your written remarks that recreation is, is fun, and you mentioned humorously that speaking of the philosophy of education, you, you still did not mean for it to sound not like fun because many times we think philosophy is more serious. You made a very intriguing statement, which I wish you'd expand upon. You said that recreation can be serious, the object of serious planning as well as serious scrutiny. Then you went on to, to expand upon that in the paper. Would you do that for us now, for the audience? Well, Keeping in mind the fun aspect right. of it. I think the fun aspect of it should never be forgotten because if it is, then it's not going to give us the kind of perspective that I think recreation should and the kind of joy in our lives that I think recreation should. When I say that it can also be serious, I mean that not in the sense that I think seriousness and fun are mutually exclusive. Many people think that, okay, that, that, that serious activity can't be fun. But I think if you reflect on just some common examples, uh, if you ask a uh, football player who's very serious about his football playing, okay, whether it's also fun, most of them will say, yes, indeed, that's why I do it, even though they're very serious about it. So once we realize that the two are not mutually exclusive, as the, the uh, usual characterization of them is, uh, here's a philosopher who's going to, as I say in the paper, here's a philosopher who's going to take the fun out of fun now. Well, I, I don't mean to do that, and I think that if we look at um, the, if we reflect upon the value of recreation in the way I've tried to encourage people to do, that's a serious undertaking. Because then we have to say, where does recreation fit in the other goods of my life? That's not, that's not an answer we, we answer frivolously, frivolously uh, or a question we answer frivolously. But once we've answered it, then the point is, let's have some fun in what we've decided is the right sort of recreational activity. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've joined our program in progress, our guest uh, the, today is uh, Marvin Hinberg, a professor of philosophy at the University of Idaho. Uh, he is here dealing with a grant from the Association for Humanities, and we're discussing a paper he has written entitled, A Moral View of Recreation. Uh, Professor Hinberg, something else that you dealt with in this paper that was most interesting is that you indicated that all of us in society uh, should experience the satisfaction of developing a skill uh, in the area of recreation. You indicated in your speech that um, as I read it, that there's twofold uh, satisfaction in doing this. Would you elaborate upon what you mean by uh, the idea that it is good for us to develop a skill? Uh, and you gave some examples uh, of things that could uh, be a, a, a fun skill in sport or recreation. Well, I think that the reason I mentioned skill is that I think that play can be placed along uh, a line uh, ranging from simplicity to complexity. And the dimension that, uh, that ranges along that line is, in fact, a skill dimension. Now, the reason I think that skill is important is because certainly it requires a concentration of energy and a commitment to acquire any skill. But if you all reflect upon, say, some skill that, that has given you some trouble. It doesn't have to be a recreational skill, but uh, it can be. For instance, if you might start out as a novice rock climber, and the ropes get tangled, and you can't keep them straight, and uh, you're afraid of going over the edge of the cliff. All kinds of things have to be overcome. But eventually you make it to the top of a bluff that you didn't think you could climb, perhaps. And then the satisfaction, the joy, the fun, and the play all come together in that. And I think that we see this again and again and again. Children smile when they learn to master the language, which is a skill also. Uh, 
I think that simplicity is linked to this skill acquisition in the sense that simplicity, uh, the simple activities I've argued for as important recreational activities, ones we should foster more, such as hiking, walking, that sort of thing, they were skills at one time, skills that were very hard won as children. We forget that. And one of the reasons we enjoy uh, walking, and the reason that I think it relieves our mind, relieves our burden, is we, we, it's so familiar to us now. And there's just a real pleasure in uh, coming to terms with that familiarity. So we're looking at it temporally from the other side. So you're indicating that uh, there's great enjoyment in mastering something that you cannot do, and then even following that, that as you become uh, more involved in the details and refining that, that there's additional enjoyment. Additional enjoyment. And there's also enjoyment in, in uh, once you've acquired the skill, using it again uh, just because of the familiarity mm -hmm. in it. Janelle Burke. In the area of recreational ethics, we sometimes think of <coughs> animals and the, the landscape in general as, being, as having a moral right almost or, or of having violated them in some way when we litter or when we perhaps uh, uh, mistreat the animals. Uh, you spoke to that in your, in your paper, and would you share with us your feelings about animals or landscape having a moral right? Well, I, I don't think they do have. I don't think features of the landscape nor animals, either one, have moral rights. Uh, let me explain why they can't have moral rights. Moral rights are matters that are, among human beings, uh, universal. Uh, I can't have one unless I have the duty to protect. I can't have a moral right unless I have the concomitant duty to protect you in the exercise of that same right. Uh, and so it's simply a matter of logic that rights are correlative with duties. Animals and features of the landscape can't have duties toward me, so they simply can't have moral rights. Uh, lots of people have argued that they should, that we should accord to moral rights. Now, I don't want anybody to take from that the assumption that I don't think the landscape, features of the landscape should be protected or endangered species be protected. Indeed, I don't. I think there are other good arguments and good grounds for protecting them, mainly our own interests, our own rights. We are impoverished when a species uh, of large mammals is exterminated because now our uh, options for variety, for experience, are lessened. But one of the reasons I'm, I'm adamant about this point, that we shouldn't talk about features of the landscape, nor species, nor animals, as having moral rights, is that to talk that way can tend to bring into contempt the rights of human persons whose rights now are not being respected. And I'm thinking here of minorities or possibly unpopular persons. And so I don't think we, we should. Logically, we can't extend rights talk to animals, moral rights talk. And if we do, we run the risk of endangering the rights of people who are in danger right now. Already. Would you apply that same line of uh, thinking to, to the matter of littering? Well, I would say that littering is, uh, you don't violate any rights the landscape has to be pristine or clean or anything like that, uh, that would be very hard to make out uh, if you claim that sort of thing. What you do do is violate the rights of people who come after you. Uh, and I think that's a matter of some importance and therefore uh, ought, it ought to be observed that we don't do that. Robert Singletary. Dr. Hinberg, I'd like to uh, ask you to comment on a statement that you made about the relationship of um, recreation to work, and oftentimes recreation becomes a means rather than an end in itself, and it, it is actually to improve, we look upon it as to improve work, that we go back and refresh ourselves to come back and do a better job mm -hmm. rather than actually a means uh, in itself. I think that's certainly a widely held belief about recreation. That is that uh, if you ask most employers why they give uh, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks of paid vacation a year to their employees, they'll, t they'll t talk about it in terms of productivity and that sort of thing. I don't object to that. I mean, they have to uh, 
they have to satisfy their uh, stockholders and other people like that. And uh, I think that it makes sense. I mean, that certainly is one of the effects of recreation from their vantage point. But I don't think those of us who are, uh, get our vacations should uh, buy that. Because I think that's a, a quite impoverished view of what we can really do, of the real potentials. Um, and I think that leisure activity is a dimension of our persons that is as important as other dimensions. That is, it's as important as our choice of career uh, and other choices. Well, possibly not that important. Now, that's overstating it. But it is a dimension of our persons that is very important and, uh, and ought to be regarded as such. Do you think in terms of, of trying to uh, build that sort of image that uh, the view of recreation and educational institutions, for instance, in uh, helping create lifelong types of, of uh, recreation rather than something that we do to uh, take up slack in the middle of the day to prepare us for the next class or this type of thing? Well, I think education is the, the, the greatest hope for that sort of thing. Uh, and in fact, I, I guess you've just hit upon one of the reasons that I wanted to uh, not only write the lecture, but uh, um, obtain the grant and put the whole series forward is that I think that even if people don't agree with me, if I can get them to reflect about it and think about their uh, objectives in this, then I've done a service. Uh, and that's what I've hoped to do. So I think education is, is a very important uh, matter here. Muriel Kirkpatrick. You addressed the idea of people's responsibilities in the paper. And I was wondering, um, how do you see people's responsibilities to each other in terms of recreation? For example, what about the age-old uh, controversy between the cross-country skiers and the snowmobilers? Whose rights are, are more important and, and who decides? That's a very, very difficult question. I, I would argue that that in matters of public policy, that the utilitarian precept of distributing the greatest happiness among the greatest numbers is, is a worthy goal for the legislator or the policymaker to have in mind. And that makes it incumbent upon us not to analyze the um, conflict between cross-country skiers and snowmobilers from the standpoint of either the cross-country skier or the snowmobiler. Uh, personally, I love cross-country skiing, and I would be, in my personal view, tempted to analyze it from that standpoint. Uh, but of course, if I step back and put myself in the shoes of the snowmobiler, I have to say, well, that's a legitimate recreational pursuit, so long as it's pursued in a sensible and uh, orderly fashion. So what I think we have to do is we have to put constraints on both activities so that we can make room for both and see that neither is excessively harmful to the environment. Um, it tends to get, uh, or what tends to get talked about is the potential destructiveness of snowmobiles and uh, uh, other sorts of uh, consumptive equipment uh, when they're taken out into a natural environment. We've all heard stories about that. But it's not a one-tided case. Uh, as a matter of fact, cross-country skiers are causing great problems with wildlife because cross-country skiers can get into the winter habitat of wildlife much more quietly and much uh, without raising a ruckus and uh, disturb the habitat of wildlife much easier, in a sense, than snowmobilers can. See? So there's, a, there's an impact upon the environment that cross-country skiers have to be and should be aware of okay, when, they're, when they're doing this. So that uh, I think the same constraints, which are constraints of moderation uh, and reason, have to be applied to both. Professor Hinberg, in your paper, in, near the end, uh, you indicated that in a trip that you took to the Yellowstone National Park, you had a, an experience that 
uh, I think drives home a point about uh, modern uh, pace of living, and that is that it appears that many people uh, cannot take time to enjoy recreation or enjoy the natural surroundings while attempting to do so. Uh, would you uh, explain to us uh, what kind of problem this is created for our enjoyment uh, of our environment and recreation? Well, it, it's a simple problem of the, the, the time schedule of the workplace carrying over into recreation. Now, I, I'm, I believe the clock has to be our conscience and our master uh, when we're working. Our society depends upon it. Our, our whole society is predicated upon that, and it certainly makes sense. But when you start putting recreation on a time schedule and driving through four western national parks in five days, uh, you stop enjoying it. It takes the fun out of it. Uh, play is spontaneous. And if you put it on a schedule, you're, you're undercutting what you can really get out of play, I think. Janelle, we have about one minute. Well, this is perhaps then I should ask you, really, that, uh, about leisure time and about the arts in leisure time and how the arts might relate to the environment in your leisure time. I don't know how the arts would relate to the environment specifically. I, I, in one minute, I don't dare answer that <laughs> question. I think the better part of uh, valor is discretion here. But, but I can say that what I would say about what I've said about recreation pointing toward the environment would also be true of the enjoyment of the arts. There, uh, appreciating arts is a skill as well, and so it makes sense to cultivate skill there too. Professor Hanberg, although we don't have to follow the clock at all times, I'm afraid we do on this program, and uh, <laughs> we're out of time. Uh, thank you for being with us. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed these six programs we brought you in the past few months, uh, dealing with our responsibility for nature, a grant from the Association for Humanities in Idaho. Next week, we'll come back to you with a totally different topic, and I hope you'll be with us that time. And until then, have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. <laughs>